This talk is about effective uh, brain-computer interfaces, and in particular about a specific phenomenon which is important in the technical development of such interfaces, and ma that manifests itself when subjects express anger. Uh, you know, a quick reminder uh, of the basics of BCIs. If you want to develop a brain-computer interface, essentially you need three things. You need to identify a target brain area, ideally associated with a cognitive process. You need to be able to capture uh, a brain signal, ideally uh, not too noisy and in real time. And you need the subjects to be able to have a cognitive strategy to activate that area. Now, that's easier said than done, of course, for motor areas, which are under volitional control. That's not a major difficulty. But for effective brain-computer interfaces, there is a challenge. By nature, it's difficult to control uh, your emotions, and the, the entire user interface design is made more complex because of that. So generally, this is addressed by uh, different aspects. One is to work on the cognitive strategies that subject can use to uh, express emotions. And the other is more with the interfa interface paradigm itself. In particular, neurofeedback is a popular mechanism to uh, make it possible for subjects to control areas of the brain that are normally uh, not thought to be under volitional control. The ideal, but also a bit naive, uh, method for developing effective BCI would be to try to locate a brain area in which a specific emotion is located. Unfortunately, uh, you know, current uh, neuroscience thinking and knowledge uh, tends to disprove that. There's a very good review by Lindquist, 2012, that quite convincingly suggests that there is no such thing as a localization of emotion. So if you Move back prior to 2005, people thought that they would find fear in the amygdala, then it was arousal, and all that has since been disproved. Another option is to take an opposite strategy. Start with something which has a neuroanatomical substrate and look if it correlates with an effective dimension. And that happens to be the case with one of the, you know, what more neuroanatomical there is than brain asymmetry. And if you take a specific area, which is the prefrontal cortex, uh, there's been a lot of work dedicated to the asymmetry in the prefrontal cortex, uh, much of that pioneered by Richard Davidson. So we have 20 years of research in uh, prefrontal cortex asymmetry, and it's essentially correlated to one uh, effective dimension, which is not much known or not much used in traditional effective computing work, and that dimension is approach avoidance, and sometimes it's called approach and withdrawal. It's a kind of very primitive uh, Darwinian dimension. The interesting thing is that, as all dimension, it underpins more categorical emotions of higher level, and uh, this one in particular is uh, correlated to risk-taking as well as eagerness and even empathy, and of course anger, since it's the topic of the presentation. Uh, but the other interesting thing is that it is accessible to neurofeedback, and actually there's a lot of research, clinical research, using uh, PFC asymmetry neurofeedback as an alternative uh, non-drug-based uh, um, non therapy for depression. So let's have a look at what approach and avoidance would be. So this is an approach that's defined as an appetitive stimulus. Well, it's a bit early, but at least this kind of stimulus is non-controversial, fairly popular, maybe even cross-cultural. Uh, and uh, you tend to be attracted by this uh, uh, stimulus. And there are stimuli where I don't have to tell you that you would find these repulsive, such as this one. But the, the prefrontal cortex controls us, but we also control the prefrontal cortex. And actually, the prefrontal cortex is an area of executive control. So approach and avoidance can be overruled. You can approach something that you don't like, and you can avoid something that you like. If I'm on a diet, I am, I am going to withdraw from the pizza, even though normally it elicits approach. And about the scorpions, well, you know, I can end up eating the scorpions instead of the pizza. So those things you have to do for science. Now, the interesting thing about, uh, about anger uh, is, is uh, turns out to be really important for the design of such interfaces. When I presented approach and avoidance, many of you thought that there's a big ambiguity with valence 
Is it not the case that a positive stimulus is always an eliciting approach or a negative stimulus is always eliciting withdrawal? Well, actually, in the case of anger, the very interesting phenomenon is that it's approach-related. When you're angry at someone, you're actually targeting that someone. So it's approach-related, but it's, its balance is negative. And approach and, and balance are decorrelated. Hence, if you are able to build an anger-based uh, BCI based on approach, you are sure that it's based on approach and there's no ambiguity with balance. And that's very important in the validation of that type of technology. So, the method we use for signal acquisition is a functional near infrared spectroscopy. Uh, so, why do we do that? Because uh, you know it's a metabolic method with a good spatial resolution, and in particular, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is the area we're interested in, is easily accessible to FNIRS. There is a lot of previous work in FNIRS on emotional function, and it's also amenable to neurofeedback. Uh, and it should also be noted that there are new feedback studies with real-time fMRI, which is also a metabolic technique, and from these studies we derive some inspiration for the methodology in this work. And if you are regular at UIS, which is not my case, uh, you would have heard previous talks on, on FNERS, which is also why I think we were attracted to submit here. Uh, we use a pretty standard commercial FNIR system, which is the, the biopack. It comes with you know, a, a small uh, headband, which is frontal electrodes, and for us it's really perfect because we're only interested in, in a small part of the prefrontal cortex. And with four, well, these electrodes are actually called optodes because in, it's an optical method, and we're essentially interested in, in the top left and right optodes. What we're doing as a signal, we're mainly using HBO, and we're simply uh, subtracting uh, left activity uh, uh, and right activity. Now, the this is the interesting part of the experiment. It's the real design of the, the neurofeedback BCI. So in this design, uh, subjects will be asked to express anger at a virtual character. And this virtual character would have been introduced previously as being a bad guy, and we'll see that in, in a minute. And the principle of neurofeedback is that you're trying to activate certain specific functions. You nev you, you, you've never done that before, so you don't know how to do it. So essentially, your, your brain activity is somehow wandering. If you're getting a feedback signal which confirms that you're activating in the right direction, then you're, you're hooking up to whichever cognitive strategy you have at the moment. So uh, your feedback is really uh, uh, an interesting method. Uh, for, for subjects when they have to uh, activate areas they did not think themselves capable of. And uh, in this system, uh, they will be uh, resting, they're wearing the, the band with the optodes, they're also wearing a kind of, you know, a, a cloth on top of it, this is just for uh, ambient light uh, reduction. And the system in real time will be measuring the uh, prefrontal cortex asymmetry based on the real time HBO values. And whether it crosses a threshold uh, compared to a baseline activity, of course, the feedback gives a visual signal, which is in that case, the bad guy is disappearing. So if you're successfully expressing anger at the bad guy, the bad guy is disappearing. How do we know is a bad guy? So we have a kind of narrative approach and people are introduced to a, a short you know, medical drama type of animation where there's a nice doctor, you see her here, and there's a bad guy uh, who's a bully and he has basically all possible you know, evil traits you can imagine. as uh, misbehaving and you get to uh, really dislike him. What you know, do you think you're doing? Pretty quickly. Relax. I was just being friendly. You do that again and I report you. Yeah, whatever. You should be a clever girl and let the real doctors do their work. What are you talking about? You better learn your place, or things will become more difficult for you. So you clearly have here a compilation of uh, every, uh, you know, uh, evil trait in a colleague, and, and that gives also, uh, it's, it's a constructive approach to expressing anger. We try to refrain from, you know, universal stimuli, and of course, you know, there are ethical constraints on how to, you can get people to experience anger. It is particularly important for neurofeedback that the anger is targeted, and if ideally it's targeted at the visual component of the neurofeedback, then you get a very strong system. 
The problem with metabolic uh, brain-computer interfaces is that you have no fixed baseline. If you were using EEG and prefrontal asymmetry with EEG, there is a fixed baseline which is called an A2 value, which is a characteristic of every single subject. So you could calibrate with the subject and you're done. Everything which is metabolic is fluctuating. So what we're doing is that we're measuring the, the increase of asymmetry from a previous epoch, which is a neutral epoch in which subjects are looking at the evil character, but they are given a counting task. So they have cognitive load, but it's not effective. And that is used for measuring the baseline against which uh, the uh, symmetry score uh, will be uh, calculated. And as with all neurofeedback methods, you have something which is called a mapping. So the mapping is a decision of by how much you depart from the baseline and you move to the maximum threshold, which would give you the maximum feedback visual output. In that case, you know, once you read 100%, the bully disappears completely, and in between, there are different strategies to get uh, visual neurofeedback, and opting for a linear strategy is generally an acceptable option if your signal variations are not too uh, erratic, which is the case here. So what we're doing, you'll see the details in the paper, we're doing real-time statistical testing and a co -ND in real time uh, to determine the mapping values. Now, summarizing a bit what I've just said through our, our UIST kind of you know, official video, so this is the installation uh, as it looks. Subjects, you know, are, are wearing the, the optodes, uh, and that's the measurement in real time. Simply, you know, the right and left uh, uh, HBO activities and uh, the real time difference. And that's the video they're presented after which they enter neurofeedback, and that's a real neurofeedback session where you see the, the bully disappearing when the subject is successful at expressing anger. So neurofeedback is something which is difficult and fluctuating. Here we have metabolic data which have low fluctuations, so it kind of dampens the, the oscillation and, and to some extent uh, facilitates uh, the neurofeedback task itself. Now, Going to um, the results, uh, this is uh, a sample plot for one successful individual. Uh, what it shows is that the difference in activity is moderate during the, the calibration, the cognitive task, during which even though he or she has been introduced to the character as a bully by being given a, a counting task, they're not expressing any anger. And when they get to the neurofeedback phase, under the instruction of expressing their anger, you can see the difference in activity. And an interesting finding is that um, when you're measuring a symmetry between left and right, you know, you have different components for a given a symmetry value. You could have, you know, left going up, right going down, or only uh, right going down. And what we have here in most cases is that it's an increase in left uh, prefrontal cortex uh, activity. If you plot the results uh, through the, actually the, the, the system itself, you'll see during a neurofeedback epoch, you'll see the uh, left part of the PFC uh, flaring a bit. And, and the following um, result for our, our set of 11 subjects uh, are uh, you know, pretty good considering state of the art in, uh, in neurofeedback. We define success, so they go through six neurofeedback epochs. We define success in a way which is pretty standard in BCI work as subject being successful on half of these epochs. If you use that criterion, we have 73% of subjects uh, who were successful. And if you just look across subjects at the individual neurofeedback blocks, 58% are successful. Now, if you look at the state of the art, uh, you know, that's uh, state of the art or above. Uh, in particular, considering a very important aspect, Normally, neurofeedback requires training. You need 10 hours or more, depending on, on, on trials. And we did that with very minimal training. Um, the reason why we didn't uh, engage in extensive training with subjects is that there are ethical implications in, in changing possibly the asymmetry baseline, and we're not a clinical unit. So we've been erring on the safe side, which has not prevented us from you know, getting interesting results. Now, the, there are many ways in the paper of analyzing the results and plotting them. One thing that uh, is particularly interesting is the, the right-hand side of this plot, which really shows that during the cognitive load task, you really don't have any asymmetry, and then it, it goes up during the neurofeedback epoch task. This plot uh, confirms that the asymmetry is primarily due to an increase in the left uh, 
prefrontal cortex uh, activity. And if you plot the entire population of subjects with, the, with their standard deviation, you really see a clear distinction between the neurofeedback uh, left minus right activity and the calibration task. So I'm um, reaching the conclusions. Um, what this, uh, this study suggests is that you know, FNIRS work for neurofeedback, but that has been established by others before us. But what is interesting is that it's, it's possible to get uh, prefrontal asymmetry via anger, so in a situation where uh, clearly approach is decorrelated from valence. Uh, we had you know, previous studies and ongoing studies on using empathy where uh, approach is not decorated from valence, so it's important for the global validation of uh, prefrontal cortex asymmetry as a BCI method uh, that these results were obtained. So in further work, we'll look at cognitive strategies that will try to relieve this ambiguity between approach and valence when valence is positive. And if you're interested in, in our line of work, uh, in the ACM Digital Library, you could find our augmented human paper on neurofeedback, and you can also find our ICMI paper on empathy. Actually, ICMI is this very same week, so I have a colleague presenting our paper there. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, I have one question. Uh, so you only used uh, one scenario in your study. Uh, I'm wondering whether there is a variety of ways for people to express their angers and whether there is a kind of taxonomy behind, behind this. Uh, you mean in terms of anger elicitation? Uh, I mean whether there is more than one kind of way to, for people to experience and express their anger. <coughs> Well, in, uh, in neurofeedback, actually, you're expressing it, and we don't know the level of anger experience, because this is not some, you know, there, this is an emotional control situation. Uh, all work in emotional control, you are, especially when you're asking people either to arouse or to go from a resting state to an agitating state. So we had work, for instance, uh, with colleagues in Tel Aviv on controlling the amygdala. Um, this is a very unusual situation. If you, if you have natural ecological anger, and I suggest you calm down, you'll be calming down. But if you're smiling and I say, now you should get angry, that's a very difficult task. And that's what neurofeedback is about. Okay. Hi. Hi, I'm Erin Solovey from Drexel University. Very nice work. Nice to meet you, and we read all your papers <laughs> with great interest. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm interested in this, and I, my question is actually related to what you were just talking about, which is, so you were asking people to elicit this anger. Um, would, how well would this work if you were just trying to detect um, anger that's naturally occurring? Um, well, you lose the linear feedback aspect, and that's the, you know, the, the whole idea. There, there are two aspects. Experimentally, we're trying not to use the traditional frustration-based methods for anger because we're not sure that the target will be part of the neurofeedback visual circuit. Right, yeah, and actually I was, my other question was related to, would, do you see other applications besides neurofeedback for um, well, measuring uh, anger? Actually, this comes out of an application we've published in 2013 at Ishkai, but was using EEG and fMRI. Uh, it's interactive storytelling, so that, that the story that you've seen is actually an eight-minute uh, virtual drama, and you can modify the course of the, of the narrative if you express empathy with the nice doctor. And that has been you know, published at Ishkai, and the video is available on YouTube for an eight-minute video with fMRI data and, and EEG data. Uh, so we started with the application, and then as we got a bit more into the technique, we, we realized that there was some fundamental issue with the uh, prefrontal asymmetry, and in particular this valence uh, uh, approach uh, ambiguity, which could only be resolved by... Uh, by anger. And um, the reason why we moved to FNIRS is that we read your work and uh, we found that uh, you know, it was very uh, well accepted for interfaces and, and very good for detecting the prefrontal cortex. Okay, thank you.